أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه إن شاء الله we'll start today with the third fitna so we finished the introduction the fitna of faith and the solutions the fitna of wealth <coughs> and also children were were part of the wealth and the fitna of wealth and we talked about the solutions for it last time and also today we'll start the fitna of knowledge and the solutions. Before we get there, just a quick reminder, the verse, we said the most important verse to remember because the surah revolves around this verse. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made everything on this earth, zina, decoration, ornament, in order to test us. And also, we saw how the verse usually, after each story, you find a verse that takes you back to that main verse. And in the story we talked about last time, the fitna of the wealth and the man with the two gardens or the two orchards, the verses ended with al-mal wal-banun zinatul hayatul dunya, that wealth and children are the ornament of this worldly life, which takes us back to the word zina from the introduction. And also the story that comes after that and the fitna that comes after that, even though it's about knowledge, but you'll find al-mal wal-banun. You'll find there, there is wealth and there is children involved in the story of al-Khadr and Musa alayhi salam, which is related to the fitna of knowledge and we'll see how. Now, so wealth and children, as mentioned in the previous verse, al-mal wal-banun, zinatul hayat al-dunya. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tested this man with the two orchard with wealth and children, but he failed the test. And we see similar stories where people failing the test because they did not have the knowledge. So Qarun, for example, from Surah uh, Al-Qasas, we know Qarun and we know his story, how he was very wealthy, etc. But because he did not have a Islamic knowledge or religious knowledge that will help him keep that wealth that will help him be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and attribute all the uh, wealth that he has to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he ended up losing all of it. The same thing happened with the men with the two gardens. And there is a beautiful hadith, which we all heard of before, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa uh, talking about the, 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 this worldly life, there are four kinds of people. And he said, the first of them is a man whom Allah gave knowledge and wealth and he said this person he uses his knowledge in order to spend his money for the sake of Allah to keep good relations with his family etc and to help the poor and the needy etc so the prophet ﷺ told us that this man who has both the knowledge and has the wealth he is the highest in the highest status or in the highest level when it comes to being good and he talked about the second person who had knowledge but no wealth. And he said, if I had the same amount of wealth as the first man, I would do the same thing. And Allah gives him the same reward because of his intention. And then he talks about the third man, the third kind of person, which is a person who has wealth, but he has no knowledge. And this, the Prophet ﷺ tells us he is the worst because he uses that money to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to commit evil and to spread evil as well. And the same thing applies to the fourth kind of people, which is the man who doesn't have knowledge or wealth. And he says, I wish I had the same amount of wealth as the third man in order to do all the bad things he's doing. And he gets the same punishment. So the story of Al-Khadr that we're going to look at now reminds us, look at what happened to the man with the orchard. He did not have knowledge, so he ended up losing all of it. So it tells us the importance of having knowledge, the importance of keeping that knowledge, and also tells us with the knowledge of Al-Khidr, you'll see that there were people who had wealth, people who had children. What happened with the wealth and the children? We'll look at that together. So the fitna of knowledge, and as we said, remember, the reason the surah was revealed. The, the, the reason the surah was revealed, we talked about it in two halaqas before, the first part of Surah Al-Kahf. And we're almost done. We have, we're going to do it in four halakas, inshallah. We have, this is the third one. And the next one is the fourth and we'll be done. So the, the reason the surah was revealed was the people of Mecca, the disbelievers, they wanted to know something 
that the Prophet ﷺ more didn't know and that will prove to them that he's not a prophet and they went and asked the Jewish scholars and the Jewish scholars told them to ask him about three things and we know the whole story. So the Prophet ﷺ did not say inshallah and that's why the knowledge did not come to him immediately and he had to wait for at least 15 days and the disbelievers started making fun of him and started mocking him that he doesn't know, that he's not a prophet, etc. So this was a lesson for us all and for the Prophet Sallallahu that if the knowledge comes from Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala, so do not say, I will bring you the news of something or the information about something except by the will of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala. وَلَا تَقُولَنَّ لِشَيْنِ إِنِّي فَعَلُونَ ذَلِكَ غَدًا إِلَّا أَنْ يَشَاءَ اللَّهِ So the, the reason the surah the reason the surah was revealed is the, the Prophet ﷺ did not attribute the knowledge to Allah. He did not say, inshallah. And the reason that Al-Khadr is meeting with Musa ﷺ, or Musa has to go all the way to Al-Khadr ﷺ, is that Musa ﷺ had the fitna of knowledge. When he was giving a speech in front of the children of Israel, it was a very, very good speech that people were tearing. And after the speech was over, a man goes to Prophet Musa السلام, and he asks him, what, are you the most knowledgeable man on earth? Or is there anyone on earth who knows more than you? And Musa السلام, he says, I am the most knowledgeable man on earth. And instead of saying Allahu A'lam, instead of being humble, instead of saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave me all this knowledge, he said, I am the most knowledgeable person on earth. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted him to meet Al-Khadr. So, the story here coming to remind the disbelievers of Mecca, Muhammad is just a messenger, just like Musa is just a messenger who did not have knowledge. And when he said, I know I am the most knowledgeable, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught him a listen, just like he taught our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam a listen, but not revealing the information right away. And this is a lesson for all of humanity to attribute your knowledge to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to say, inshallah, before you claim that you have something other people don't know. So the story of Musa and Al-Khidr as we said, involves knowledge and wealth and children. Why did Musa السلام, meet with Al-Khidr? Uh, the hadith is mentioned in Bukhari, as we said, that he claimed he's the most knowledgeable person on earth. So the story starts with قَالَ مُوسَى لِفَتَاهُ لَا أَبْرَحْ حَتَّى أَبْلُغَ مَجْمَعَ الْبَحْرَيْنِ Story starts right here. وَإِذْ قَالَ مُوسَى لِفَتَاهُ لَا أَبْرَحْ Sister Sabine is asking, so perhaps by knowledge we mean belief in Allah, not knowledge as we know relative to worldly matters. Yeah, so basically knowledge of the, the religion, knowledge of things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not give to everyone, not the common knowledge that everybody knows, right? So, and this also will apply to worldly things. And I'll explain that inshallah in the coming part of the, uh, of the halaqa. So the, the story starts with قَالَ مُوسَى لِفَتَاهُ Prophet Musa, remember or behold, Prophet Musa السلام, said to his fata. The word fata is used to mean a servant. Like the scholars re refer to him as a servant, the person who was with Musa السلام, and that was Prophet Yusha ibn Nun. However, the Arabic word used fata literally means young man. And this is the Quran way of showing the, the politeness of how to treat, a, how to address a prophet or how to address a servant even. And there is a beautiful hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu tells the Sahaba, none of you should say my slave or my female slave, even when they are referring to the person that is considered a slave. And the scholar said that this is out of respect. And the Prophet said, use the word fata, which is used here in this surah. Fata means young man, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is referring to Prophet Yusha ibn Nun, who was with Prophet Musa alayhi salam as fata, as a young man, even though he was the servant of Prophet Musa at that time. And all Prophet Musa wanted from him is to keep the fish with him. So, إِذْ قَالَ مُوسَى لِفَتَاهُ لَا أَبْرَحُ حَتَّى أَبْلُغَ مَجْمَعَ الْبَحْرَيْنِ أَوْ أَمْضِيَ حُقْبَ So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him that you are going to meet with somebody who knows more than you, somebody who has more knowledge than you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him where to go, which is مَجْمَعَ الْبَحْرَيْنِ, a place where the two seas meet. 
So Musa alayhi salam is saying to you, Shaib Nunun, I'm not going to do anything until I reach that place, Majma' al-Bahrain, or I keep walking for years and years to come. I do not care how long it takes me. And this shows us the perseverance of how Musa alayhi salam wants to gain that knowledge from al-Khadr, no matter how long he has to walk, no matter how far he is, no matter how many years it takes. The word huquba is used uh, in, in another surah, la bithina fiha ahqaba. The, it refers to the people who are going to spend long and long time in the hellfire. And some people use that word to say, hey, there will be an end to the hellfire. However, the word huquba or ahqaba can be used to mean indefinite amount of time. So Musa basically is saying, I'll spend an indefinite amount of time walking until I reach this man so that I learn from him. And subhanAllah, if we look at the past and how the scholars or how the Sahaba would even, uh, some of them would walk for months and months just to get one hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. فَلَمَّا بَلَغَ مَجْمَعَ بَيْنِهِمَا So Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala told him to go to that certain place and he told him to take a fish with him salted fish according to some narrations and prophet yusha and prophet musa السلام, were both eating from that fish and the and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told them that the sign that you're in the place where to find al-khadr is that uh, is the fish itself the fish will come back to life so so when prophet musa السلام, and yusha arrived at the rock they wanted to rest so Prophet Musa alayhi salam fell asleep. And Prophet Yusha alayhi salam, he saw the fish coming back to life and jumping into the sea. So, and he did not want to wake Prophet Musa alayhi salam because he felt that he, you know, it would be inappropriate to wake up the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam. So he wanted to tell him in the next morning or when he wakes up. So when they reached the majma' that place where the two seas meet, So the hoot or the fish, when it jumped into the water, it actually made some kind of passage in the water. And in a narration Sahih al-Bukhari, and this is causing some problems and I'll talk about it inshallah as well, is that when they reached the rock where Prophet Musa alayhi salam uh, like uh, fell asleep there was a water spring that is, is referred to as the water spring of life or the spring of life and some of the water from that water spring touched the fish that was already dead as we said they were they have been eating from it and the fish came back to life and jumped into which was a miracle of course and jumped into the ocean so now let's look at the next verses and see what happens next now Prophet Musa alayhi salam is awake and they are starting to move again. But Prophet Yusha alayhi salam, he forgot to tell the Prophet Musa about what happened with the fish. So when they continued walking, Prophet Musa says to Yusha alayhi salam, can you hear me? Because it says low system resources, something may affect your audio. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. Alhamdulillah. All right. So Prophet Musa alayhi salam says to uh, Yusha alayhi salam, Atina ghada'ana, give us our lunch. Laqad laqina min safarina hadha nasaba. We've been tired through our, uh, through our journey. So, the scholars said that the word nasaba here, the fact that Prophet Musa salam, used the word nasaba, which means being tired, gives us permission as Muslims to complain. Because some people say it's absolutely forbidden to complain, period, without any conditions. However, the correct opinion is that complaining is permissible as long as the person does not complain about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or is not indignant basically he's not you saying like why are allah are you doing this to me or if the person is complaining about allah himself for doing this to him or complaining about qadar the fate 
So the scholar said it's permissible to complain, especially that the Prophet وسلم, when he when he was dying and he had the headache, Aisha radiallahu anha comes in and she said, Ra'si ya Rasulullah, wa ra'sah, like I have pain in my head. Aisha is saying that. And the Prophet said, No, it is actually my head that has the pain, not yours. So the Prophet وسلم, complained, but he's not complaining about Allah, not complaining about Qadr. He is satisfied with what Allah has prescribed for him, but he's just telling Aisha radiallahu anha what he's feeling. Same thing with the poison. When the Prophet sallallahu goat was poisoned, after the years after that, he kept saying that I still find the pain from that goat from Khaybar, the goat that had the poison in it. So from this, from this verse and from the hadith that I just mentioned, the scholar said it is permissible to complain as long as you're not complaining about Allah, as long as you are not complaining about Qadr, as long as you're not uh, showing dissatisfaction with what Allah has prescribed for you. However, they said the best if you don't complain at all to anyone and complain to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Now, like uh, Prophet uh, Ya'qub said, قَالَ إِنَّمَا أَشْكُ بَثِّي وَحُزْنِي إِلَى اللَّهِ قَالَ أَرَأَيْتَ The next word, قَالَ أَرَأَيْتَ إِذْ أَوَيْنَا إِلَى السَّخْرَةِ So now Prophet Musa said, I'm tired, get us some food. قَالَ أَرَأَيْتَ إِذْ أَوَيْنَا إِلَى السَّخْرَةِ Now Prophet Yusha alayhi salam remembered. So he says, remember when we stayed at the rock? فَإِنِّي نَسِيتُ الْحُوتِ I have forgotten about the the hood, the fish. And it was shaitan who made me forget. And he told him that I saw the fish actually taking its way, jumping into the, or the, the sea and making that passage into the sea in a wonderful way or an amazing, unbelievable way. So Prophet Musa, when he heard that, he said, Ma kunna, so Nasit reminds us that even a prophet, someone like Prophet Yusha, even Prophet Musa also is going to say Nasit, that forgetfulness is something that happens to all of us, even prophets. So we shouldn't get mad at each other if somebody forgot something, no matter how important it is. SubhanAllah, Prophet Yusha's only job was to tell Prophet Musa alayhi salam when the hoot, when the fish, uh, when the sign of the fish appears. And he forgot the one thing that he was supposed to do. So this reminder for us all, if somebody forgets something important, do not get mad at them. Look at what Prophet Musa salam did. He did not you know, yell at him or anything. You made us walk all this way when we could have done it uh, there. He didn't. He said, He said, this is it. This is the thing we were waiting for. Let's go back, right? So this is a reminder for us, husbands and wives, fathers and children, that a human insan, the root of the word insan comes from forgetfulness, which means all of us can forget even no matter how big the thing is. So let's not get angry at each other and remember that even prophets can forget. So Prophet Musa said, this is it. This is what we have been waiting for. Let's go back. And they started following their footsteps, going back to the place where they were. I think we have uh, another question. Can shaitan make us forget? Yes, so shaitan can make us forget, just like uh, situations make us forget. And, and he said, وَمَا أَنْسَنِيهُ إِلَّا shaitan." So shaitan made us forget. And subhanAllah, the, um, the shaitan comes to you in the salah to make you also forget how many rak'ah that you did, right? The, the khanzab, the Prophet mentioned the name of the shaitan. Khanzab that comes to you, so sign to you for your prayer. When you start praying, he keeps coming to you, talking to you about a lot of things, so you forget how many rakahs that you did. And the Prophet said, if he comes to you, look at your lift and say, Audhu Bilan Shaitan Rajim, and a little bit of spit. So, فَقَالَ ذَلِكَ مَا كُنَّا نَبْغُ فَارْتَدَّ عَلَىٰ أَثَارِهِمَا قَصَصَ so he said, this is what we have been wanting. Let's go back. And they followed their footsteps to go back to the same place where they were, where the rock was, where the fish jumped into the water. Now comes the important part. They found one of our slaves. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking. They found one of Allah's slaves, one of Allah's worshippers. And this is a very important word. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave that slave rahma, which means used in the Quran to mean prophecy. 
and I will explain what that means because this is the most important part here. وَعَلَّمْنَاهُ مِنْ لَدُنَّا عِلْمًا So who is Al-Khidr? His name comes from the root for the word green. Akhdar is green. And in authentic narration, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said that he was sitting on a barren land. And when he sat, there was a barren land. When he sat on it, when Al-Khadr sat on it, it became green and full of life. So that's where his name comes from. Now, is he a prophet? That's a very important question because it comes with a lot of dangerous things, as I'm going to show you now. So the first evidence is Atainahu Rahmatan Min Indina, right? Now, the word Rahma here, the scholars who believe he's a prophet, and this is the majority of scholars, Al-Jumhur, believe he is a prophet. They said the word Rahma is used in the Quran to mean prophecy or refer to prophets. And the other group, they said, hey, but the word Rahma means mercy in general, and it's used to refer to other kinds of mercy. However, and this is something that I, I tried to look at myself. So if I'm wrong, it's from me and shaitan. If it's correct, it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I looked at where the word rahmah comes with prophets. For example, here, Allah says, Atani rahmatan min indihi. When Prophet Nuh alayhi salam is talking to his people in Surah Hud, he says to them, Atani rahmatan min indihi. Allah here says, Atainahu rahmatan min indina. So it's almost the same context. Rahma min indina from us from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the same thing is what prophet salih also says in surah hud in the same surah so if you look at the word rahma in other contexts it is not going to be said in the same exact way where it's rahmatan min indina mercy from us from that he was given mercy from us it's said to prophet hud it is said in the same way to prophet Salih and it's uh, said in the same way to Prophet Khadr here at Inahu Rahmatan min Indina. Also, the word Wa'allamnahu min ladunna ilma. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I taught him from my knowledge. So, if we look at Prophet Isa alayhi salam in Surah Al Ali Imran, Allah says about Prophet Isa, Wa yu'allimuhu al kitaba wal hikmah, that Allah is the one who's teaching him al kitaba wal hikmah. So based on this, and there's more evidence, but this is just, as I'm saying, this is me. So if I'm wrong, it's from shaitan and me. If it's correct, it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if you look at the context of the Quran, how it refers to Prophet and how it refers to Prophet Khadr, you see that Allah is using almost exactly the same wordings. Now, another important verse that proves that Khadr is a prophet is in the end when he explains to Prophet Musa everything he says Wama fa'altuhu an amri. I did not do any of this out of my own like out of my own knowledge or out of my own desire it's all meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who revealed to him to do all of this especially that these are things about the future like the 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 young man he's going to kill, like the, the, the boat he's going to destroy. How did he know the future, right? Unless he is a prophet. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Jinn, عَالِمُ الْغَيْبِ Allah is the knower of the unseen. فَلَا يُظْهِرُ عَلَىٰ غَيْبِهِ أَحَدَ He does not show the unseen to anyone. إِلَّا مَنْ ارْتَضَى مَنْ رَسُولٍ Except a, a messenger that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses or is pleased with. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala surrounds him with the angels to protect the, the Prophet and the knowledge of the unseen. So Allah is telling us no one receives that knowledge of the unseen except the messengers or the prophets. So when Al-Khadr says, I did not do any of this out of my own, how did he get knowledge of the future? How did he know that the young man is going to be a disbeliever and then force his parents to be disbelievers as well how did he know that there was a king that was going to take the ship how did he know that the the wall was going to fall etc so he got all this knowledge from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he is a prophet now the second question and this is also something a lot of people claim is that he is still alive that al-khadr is still alive now the evidence that proves that he's not alive is from the quran Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا جَعَلْنَا لِبَشَرٍ مِّنْ قَبْلِكَ الْخُلْدِ أَفَإِن مِتَّفْهُمُ الْخَالِدُونَ That Allah never made any human before you, O Muhammad, to live eternally. أَفَإِن مِتْ So if you die, O Muhammad, do you think that they will be living after you, that they will live after you, or that they will live for eternity? 
And Sister Sabine says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not allow anyone less than a prophet to guide one. Very good. Allah wouldn't allow. That's also another thing that they, <coughs> scholars mentioned, that Allah wouldn't send Prophet Musa to just a normal human being to learn from him, right? It's, it's kind of like, you know, doesn't make any sense. So the evidence that he's not alive is in Surat Al-Anbiya. Allah did not make any human before you immortal. And if you die, O Muhammad, no one will be immortal. How, how could they be immortal? And evidence in the hadith. This is very important hadith. Abdullah ibn Umar, he said, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam led us in praying Isha towards the end of his life. And when he said the salam, salamu alaikum, he stood up and said, do you see this night of yours? 100 years from now, there will not be anyone left of those who are on the face of the earth. Meaning, everyone who was alive on that night that the Prophet ﷺ was talking to the Sahaba, anyone who's alive at that night will be dead in a matter of 100 years. If somebody was born the day after, yeah, they could live, right? Or if somebody was born a year after, yeah, they could live, right? But the people that were on that night, alive on the face of the earth, none of them lived beyond 100 years. So if Al-Khadr, assuming that he was alive back then, if Al-Khadr was alive, that means he would have to die 100 years from that night, right? However, there's no any evidence that proves that he was alive. So this is evidence from the Quran and evidence from the Hadith. Now, somebody might ask the question, what about the Dajjal and what about Prophet Isa alayhi salam? The answer to that, Prophet Isa alayhi salam was not on the face of the earth. The Prophet ﷺ said, on the face of the earth. We know Prophet Isa alayhi salam was lifted up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he's in, in the sama, he's not on earth. And as for the Dajjal, the Sahaba, uh, there's a great scholar named Al-Shanqiti, he said this is something in Usul al-Fiqh, which is al-khas al al uh, excluding something that is specific from a general rule. For example, we know that all acts of worship are haram, except the acts of worship that we have evidence for. Or all kinds of food are halal, except the kinds of food that we have evidence that tells us they are haram, like pork and alcohol. So the general rule is that everyone on earth will die after 100 years on that night, except the ones that we have evidence for that they will be alive. And the one exclusion is a Dajjal, because we have evidence. If we had evidence that says, yes, Al-Khadr is excluded, then we would agree that Al-Khadr is still alive, but we don't have any evidence for that. And actually all the kinds of narrations that prove that Al-Khadr is alive, all of them are completely weak. None of them is authentic. So the dangers of believing that he is not a prophet and that he is alive. So people who say he's not a prophet, they say he's a wali. Wali min awliya illa. So why is it so dangerous to believe that he is a wali, not a prophet, or that he is uh, alive today? Number one, people who make claims and bid'ah and claim they meet with al-Khadr and he told them to do these bid'ah or these things, right? So some people will claim, hey, al-Khadr came to me or al-Khadr, I saw him in the dream or something like that. And he told me that we should do this and this thing, which completely goes against what the Prophet ﷺ used to do or something that the Prophet ﷺ never did like a bid'ah. Number two, people who collect charity. There were people, this actually happened in Egypt. They would hang a, a box on, a do, on, on their door and they would say like, the money will go to Al-Khadr and he will give you whatever that you are asking for. Number three, he did not go to pledge allegiance to the Prophet Sallallahu If he was alive in the time of Prophet Muhammad, and he's still alive until today, how could he not go to pledge allegiance to Prophet Muhammad? The Prophet was sent to all of mankind. And even in the Quran, in, uh, in Surah Ali Imran, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, Allah took an oath on every Prophet. And that oath was, if I send that messenger referring to Muhammad in your time, confirming what you have come with, the Torah and the Injil, etc., that you must believe in him and that you must support him. 
So Allah made a token oath from every prophet before Prophet Muhammad that if Prophet Muhammad were to be sent in their time, that they have to believe in him, follow him, and support him. And even the hadith, authentic hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, If Musa ﷺ was alive, he would do nothing more than follow me. Right? So if Al Khadr was alive, how could he not go and pledge allegiance to the Prophet ﷺ or support the Prophet in his battles against those who are trying to kill him, etc.? And the last one is people who believe that their Shaykh is a Wali, they believe their Shaykh is a Wali can commit murder or zina, not the people, but the sheikh. Like if they see the sheikh committing murder or the sheikh committing zina or any other major sin, they will say, hey, but Al-Khidr did all of that and Al-Khidr is a wali. He killed the young man, he destroyed the ship and he, uh, and he, uh, you, you know, I, he, whatever he does, he's a wali, right? So this is the danger of believing that he's alive or that he is not a prophet. So no one on earth can say, hey, I am killing a person because I know the future and I know that uh, he's going to be bad to his parents, etc. No one can do that, right? Because the Quran made it clear that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said about him, And then the end of the verse says, So all of this evidence to prove to us that Al-Khadr is not a prophet and that he is not alive. Now, so here we stopped with, Right here. This is proving that Al-Khadr is a prophet from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Musa. Now Prophet Musa السلام, said to Al-Khadr, He asked him, may I follow you so that you teach me from the rightly guided knowledge that you have? And this also shows us how we should be polite when we are seeking knowledge. Another thing is to, and there are some lessons that we're going to learn from here. When we acquire knowledge, we need to be humble. And uh, Al-Khadr, when he saw Musa alayhi salam, Musa alayhi salam said, Assalamu alaykum to him. And Al-Khadr said, no one from here says, Assalamu alaykum, who are you? And Musa alayhi salam said, Ana Musa bani Israel. I am the Musa of bani Israel. So, so when in that conversation, Al-Khadr said to him that I know things that you do not know. Allah taught me these things. And you know things that you that I do not know. And Allah taught you this, these things. So he's attributing the knowledge to Allah, the knowledge that they both have. And he's also telling him that no matter how knowledgeable I am, even though you're coming to learn from me, there are still things that you know that I do not know. So this shows us that we all need to be humble, no matter who the person is that is uh, giving us advice or something like that, we should not look down at them or feel, hey, you, you don't even, or even if it's your child or your, your younger brother, younger sister, do not look down on them and say, hey, you're so much younger than me, how could you give me advice or something like that. So Musa alayhi salam is being humble here. He's trying to learn from this man after taking this long trip. So immediately Prophet, uh, Al-Khadr says to him, sabra. You will not be able to be patient with me, which is the second lesson we learn here. We need patience when we are acquiring knowledge. If you're not patient, you're going to give up very easily. And number three, always remembering that what we know is from Allah and compare it to Allah, we know nothing. If we compare it to Allah, we know nothing. And this comes from the next part in their trip. So after he said to him, you're not going to be able to be patient with me. How could you be patient on something that you have no knowledge of? He's, he, they got into the, the ship. And as soon as they get into the ship, a bird lands on the edge of the ship and takes a sip of water from the sea. So Al-Khadr tells Prophet Musa, alayhi salam, did you see what that bird just did? He said, yes. He said, my knowledge, your knowledge. And the knowledge of everyone on earth, or in existence basically, compared to the knowledge of Allah, is like the amount of water that this bird took from the sea compared to the sea. And this is just an image to bring the, the, the idea closer to Prophet Musa alayhi salam. However, if we compare actually all of knowledge on earth compared to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is no comparison. We cannot even compare. The knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all perfect, infinite. So we cannot even compare, but this is a use of an image to bring the idea closer 
to us and to Prophet Musa alayhi <clears throat> salam. And also, as soon as they start, before he starts telling him about anything, he shows him, hey, look at the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What you're about to see, even though it's amazing and something that you've never seen before, compared to the knowledge of Allah, it is nothing. So, of course, the condition was that the Prophet Musa would not ask him for any questions until Al-Khadr alayhi salam tells him why, why he did what he did. So when they rode on that ship, the next thing that Al-Khadr did is that he made a hole in the ship. So Musa alayhi salam immediately, and subhanAllah, the people who were the owners of the ship, they did not even take any money from Al-Khadr and Musa alayhi salam. They were going to take them for free. Because Al-Khadr, they knew him and that he, that he was a good guy. So, of course, Prophet Musa was like surprised. How could you do that to these people who just did something good to us? And the, 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 the ship is going to sink and people are going to, to die. And this takes us to the idea of hearing is different from seeing. Sometimes you hear about something, but eh, it's okay for me. Yeah, I don't care, blah, blah. But when you see that thing happening in front of you, it's a completely different story. That's why the Prophet ﷺ said, None of you should wish to meet his enemy. Meaning, you should not ask Allah, Oh Allah, send our enemy upon us so that we fight for your sake, etc. He said, no, do not do that. Why? Because here, oh, you're, you're thinking about Jannah, you're thinking about the war, you're thinking about, you know. But once you see the, the swords in front of you and, you know, like, and people, heads are flying and arms are being, you know, caught in front of you then you might completely run away or forget about everything that you learned etc so that's why prophet musa salam, he said that he's going to be okay inshallah that i'm not going to disobey you i'm not going to ask you about anything but when he saw what happened he couldn't help himself right and some scholars even say that this is because he didn't say inshallah if you look at this verse here when he told him, do not ask me about anything, Prophet Musa responded, he said, Satajiduni insha'Allahu sabira. He used insha'Allah with the word patient. amra. But he did not use insha'Allah when he said, I will not disobey your command. And that's why he disobeyed him. And he said, why did you do what you did? But this is just an opinion. So when you see something, it's completely different from when you hear about it. That's why Prophet Musa immediately interjected. So then he said, didn't I tell you we'll not be able to be patient? Also, the scholars talk from, took from this something, from the, um, the idea of Al-Khadr making a hole or ripping a board from the ship, as mentioned in the hadith in Sahih Bukhari. They said that based on this, we can take the ruling that we are permissible to do something harmful in case there is more good than harm in it, or in case it's going to bring a lot of good. And from this comes the idea of um, a tatarrus, which means in the, and the, the, the scholars, Imam Malik, Imam Ahmed, and all the four scholars talked about this. If a group of Muslims are captured in a war and the enemy uses these Muslims as a shield, to protect themselves from the arrows of the Muslims. Are we still allowed to fight? Are we still allowed to throw arrows at the enemy, even though the Muslims are being used as a shield? And Imam Ibn Tabiya and others, of course, like Imam Malik, etc., they said, if there is a huge necessity for that, then we can do it. For example, in the time of the Tatar, Ibn Taymiyyah said, if we do not do that, the Tatar are going to come, they're going to rape our women, they're going to kill us all, etc. So we have to fight no matter what they are doing. So the scholars use this, to prove that we can sometimes do something harmful, that, but that thing that is harmful will bring a lot of goodness to us and to the people involved. So, here again, Prophet Musa says, I forgot, do not, do not judge me because of my forgetfulness. Do not be too hard on me. Now they see the young man. And he was playing with other young men. And then Al-Khadr takes him and he kills him. And we need to prove that he is a young man quickly. Um, so here we see that the teacher also gives the student more than two uh, chances. And then even prophets forget, like I said, and then he killed a young man, not a child, because a lot of people attack Islam, say, hey, in your book, it says that Al-Khadr killed a child. 
But even if he's a child, I'll prove to you that it is okay in the context. But what happened here is that the word ghulam um, in Arabic language refers to a person from the day they're born till their hair becomes gray, right? <clears throat> so in Arabic language, it's, it's used to refer to all of these. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he went to Al-Mi'raj, Prophet Musa referred to Prophet Muhammad as ghulam. So he used the same word ghulam, even though Prophet Muhammad was over 40 years old. And then also from the verse itself, Prophet Musa here says, Aqatalta nafsan zakiya. Like, have you killed uh, an innocent soul? Bighayri nafs. Without a reason or without qasas. Nafs here means a soul. You killed a soul without another soul. Meaning the only way we're per we, the, the, the government is, has the permission to kill a person is if that person killed someone on purpose and there was no other way, there, like the family did not agree on the fidya or anything. So here, Musa Ali Sam said, you killed a person, even though that person did not kill someone else on purpose, right? So the, the scholars say that this is clear evidence that this was not a child because children can never be killed even if they killed someone on purpose. In Islam, a child is not mukallaf, right? So if a child kills someone, even if they did it on purpose, in Islam, the government can never kill that child. They can take the, the fidya from them, the, the money or the, the amount of money or the camels in return for the murder, but they cannot kill that person. And, this, and then he says, لَقَدْ جِئْتَ شَيْئًا نُكْرَ Another thing is in the answer when he tells him that this ghulam, uh, كَانَ Ibn Abbas said that this ghulam was a disbeliever, kafir. And you cannot call someone kafir if they are a child, especially if their parents are Muslim, right? If, a par if your parents are Muslim or Jewish or whatever, you can call the child by their parents because they're still a child. So in that case, he was supposed to be a Muslim because his parents were Muslim. But Ibn Abbas referred to the child or the young man here as a kafir, even though you cannot call a child kafir, that tells us that he is actually a young man, not a child. But even if it was a child, as we said, this is just like Allah sending an angel to take the soul of a person because that person is going to do something harmful in the future. And this also a reminder to us, uh, if Allah takes your child from you, that maybe it's good for you because look at what was going to happen to these two parents. They were going to disbelieve in Allah. They were going to be doing a lot of evil things. And also Al-Kalbi, scholars like Al-Kalbi said that this young man was committing highway robbery and he was doing a lot of evil. Sister Sabine says, so a child is only till proper, yeah, puberty, exactly. So the scholar says uh, he's a child until either one of two things, 15 lunar years, or we see, uh, the, he sees the uh, sign of puberty in his like uh, private uh, area. After that, he's not a child. Okay, so I think I have two more minutes. I'm over time, just quickly finish. The last part from this page here, now they go to the to the wall and Musa alayhi salam, he says to him, if I ask you one more time, خلاص, do not take me as your companion. And this is out of, you know, he's like being too ashamed. Now I asked him three times, I disobeyed him. This is going to be the third time. So he says, you have enough excuses to let me go. And the second lesson is doing good to those who do bad to us. Like the people, this, this village, the third village they go to, they were uh, stingy, they were rude, they did not host them. Even though they were rude, etc. Al-Khadr still built that wall for them in order to protect their uh, the wealth or the treasure for the young orphans. And the third lesson we learn is that the miskin, miskin like look at the people of the ship, they were masakin, referred to as masakin, yet they still had a ship. So someone could be poor even though they have, uh, they own something or they have certain kind of wealth, but it's not enough to cover their needs. And that's why the scholar said you can give the zakat to someone who has a job, but their job does not provide them with enough money for them and for their family. And of course, uh, if that is, if you can see that clearly, then you can give them the zakah. And number four, the taqwa of the parents reach the children. Look at the, the treasure that was under the, uh, under the wall. It's because the parents were good. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected the, the, the treasure for the children. As mentioned in Surah An-Nisa, 
من خلفهم ذرية ضعفا خافوا عليهم فليتقوا الله وليقولوا قولا سديدا If you're worried about your children in case you die then be righteous have taqwa of Allah and Allah will protect them for you even after your death just like he protected that treasure for the orphans because of the taqwa of their parents of their uh, father and then number five some bad things that happen to good people are protection for them just like what happened with the young man it was protection for the parents who were going to become disbelievers if he continued to live and finally attributing the evil to ourselves and that's what happened when al-khadr was talking when he talked about uh, things that were good he for, for example he said when he was talking about things that, that were good he attributed them to allah but when he talked about something something bad like making the hole in the ship he said i'm the one who wanted to do that hole or to remove the board from the ship so when we talk about allah we attribute it good to ourselves oh, sorry we attribute good to allah and we attribute evil to ourselves like allah says in surah nisa ما أصابك من حسنة فمن الله وما أصابك من سيئة فمن نفسك. So this is the basically the fitna of knowledge, and in order for us to be careful with the fitna of knowledge, the solutions are being humble and attributing knowledge to Allah, not having a problem learning from someone less than us, and having patience and applying what we learn, not just telling people to do something but we don't do it and teaching it to others. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله العظيم لي ولكم. If you have any questions, please let me know. Okay. So I guess وإياكم سستر سبيل. Any questions? Okay, I will see you inshallah next week. Jazakumullah khairan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.